So, after spending, how long were you in that hotel room with him? Oh, the first day I spent all day. All day? All day. And then I went home. And the six people who were there too were... So Everyone was sitting there and I thought, what the hell are we doing here? And why is he going on and on like this? And he did, of course, say, the reason you're here is because that book didn't do the job. If the book had done the job that you said you read, you wouldn't have come here. So yeah. I went home in a dilemma. Okay, so I shouldn't go back, right? He's telling me I shouldn't go back. I shouldn't bother this guy. What is it? Why am I bothering him? I should leave him alone. So I stayed at home the next day. I stayed at home. <laughs> I stayed at home and I thought, God damn it. There's, I can't not go back there. And so the next day, he was in New York for about a week, I don't know. Every day after that, I went there. And we went to the mall, and we went and did things that I would find as an artist in New York, an anathema. To go to a mall in New Jersey for coffee with some random group of people that I have nothing in common with. Yeah. Why the hell am I doing this? Yeah. Because I wanted to see if this guy was for real. Yeah, right. And there was something about his whole, the whole thing that had this funny sense about it. It's this unfettered, you know, what, what, why is it that J.K. was charging money? And why was he fooling around? And here's a guy who says all that is crap, but he doesn't charge me to sit and talk to him. Yeah. And he looks, he acts in a very interesting way. You know, yeah. He has a he has a quality about him that I cannot put my finger on. Let me figure this out. So I would observe how he moved. You know, how does he? What does he? How does he respond to things and people? And I joked with him. You know, because I'm a wise ass. I joked with him, and he nothing bothered him at all. No, no, right, right. Is that? But if if something bothers him, maybe that'll be a, a hint that he's yeah, right. You know, maybe he's holding something back. Nothing. No, so and I think it was the first day, maybe the first day, that he actually went into his little room and brought out a folder to share with me. And he said, and I want to show you this picture. And he looked like a little bad boy from the schoolyard. And he see, she gave me this picture of this image of a white elephant from some nature magazine with a huge erection. And it was having sex with this porn star woman. It had been photoshopped together, a collage. Oh, yeah. This thing. And she had this a face pasted on of the not a very attractive Asian-looking woman's face on the, on the porn star's body. He explained the whole thing to me this way. He said, this is the story of the Buddha's mother, is that a white elephant entered the Buddha's when He would, you know, he had these great gestures. He would enter the, the mother of the Buddha and, and I guess that was the impregnation of, and she was a something or other, and they weren't very good looking people, so that's the face is ugly, you know. And, uh, and there's a place in Sri Lanka called Kandy, where they have the tooth, which is the elephant sized tooth, and that's yeah. the proof of the story. And I was just listening to this, I'm like, what? <laughs> this is too, and he says, I sent this to the Dalai Lama on his mother's birthday. Because a best friend of mine is his secretary, and that guy doesn't like me anymore. And I said, well, no wonder. <laughs> well, if you're going to behave like this, it's no wonder. But I felt immediately like I really like this guy. Yeah. Because I never had any patience for the Dalai Lama. Somebody brown-nosing with movie stars in Hollywood, yeah. it just sticks in my craw. Yeah. I was never convinced by this. I mean, I, I feel bad that he got kicked out of his country. I'm sure he's a nice fellow, but he doesn't interest me one tiny little piece. No, it's like a hallmark card of spirituality. Who yeah. cares about this shit? Yeah. So I was quite relieved when Yuji shared this idiocy with me. <laughs> because also it was like right up my alley. It was very irresponsible. Or, you know, what do you call it? Irreverent. Irreverent. A little, little bit irresponsible. <laughs> and uh, I just liked it. I liked his attitude. And the fact that there was absolutely nothing going on there intrigued me. I said, he's hiding something. I'm going to get to the bottom of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was the beginning of the end. Yeah. So, I, and on a certain moment, he left, of course. He went away. And, and then, and you lived in New York? 
I was living in New York and I had just started to work freelance, which gave me a freedom I had not had before in my life. Yeah. I was working for galleries in New York and making more money per hour with less hours. I would do a job installing art, a yeah. show in a gallery, get my money, and then be free for some time. Yeah. Right. So for the first time, you know, I had been obsessed with JK, as I mentioned, for years. And here's this guy, Yuji, and he's going to be in Switzerland. And I knew all about Sonnet, where JK gave the talks in the tent. And by now, I also knew that Yuji had had some experience there that was very mysterious and strange. And so my friends were telling me uh, he's going to be there in the summer. So I thought, well, I'm going to save my pennies and I'm going to go to Switzerland and see this guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I went for two weeks. It seemed so exotic at the time. I'm going to Switzerland and I'm going to see this guy, you know. And, and um, I got there and uh, I walked into the room and he said, oh, you again. <laughs> I walked into my friend. He said, "Oh, you come all this way for what? Why did you buy, Why did you come all this way here?" And I thought, "Yeah, I don't really know, actually, but here I am." <laughs> and and you know, the nonsense just went on from there. We was talking the same strange stories, and uh, there were a couple in the back of the room. This French couple, and I was sitting toward the back because, frankly, I was a little baffled. You know, like, what is he, why is he going on and on? Yeah. But again, I, like I said, I couldn't, he had a quality which I couldn't shake. I wanted to get to the bottom of this. So they were saying, well, you know, Yuji used to give real discourses and now he stopped talking. And I thought, if somebody gets out of the mess, how can they not be fully out of the mess? How can you kind of go out and then come back and is he... Is he really not talking? Is he really not teaching? I'm going to go right into the front row and I'm going to engage with him. I'm going to pester him with questions and I'm going to make him answer. Yeah. And so I went up to the front of the classroom, you know, and I started talking to him. I, I thought, I'm going to ask him about this whole business of headlessness that he described that happened in London, just to see what happened. So I start talking. Headlessness? Yeah, he, he at one point had an experience in around 63 or early 60s when he was in London where he said that he could no longer feel his head above his eyes. And he, where is my head gone? Where are my thoughts coming from? I don't understand any of this. I'm just telling you what was in the book and I, I wanted to use this as a pretext yeah. to ask him, what do you mean by that? So I had that in, all right, I'll just do this as a means of getting information from him, of engaging with him. And so I started asking him about that. And it was really fascinating because he was describing things and then he would go off on a tangent and then I would think, he's getting away here. He's, he, you know, the tiger is getting out of the cage. Yeah. Know, but how am I going to get him back? So I'd throw a chunk of meat in there. You know, he, but you said... And then he would kind of come all the way back around and talk about things. And I was asking him stuff. At one point, I think he said the sex urge was gone when I did this and this. And I said, well, what about masturbation? You're telling me you never masturbated? I mean, I, was, I couldn't believe what I was saying to the guy. But yeah. again, I was thinking, if he has something to hide, then he'll get angry. Or yeah. if I've overstepped a line, then that'll prove there were no lines. There was no overstepping anything. I could say or ask anything I wanted. And so and he that, never got angry. No, in fact, he was uh, very much available for anything. <laughs> there was no resistance. No. At, at all to anything. Um, you know, in the future, if if I saw him get what I would call angry, it was only if I was trying to impose something or say something premeditated. And this exchange I had with him was really crucial for me because it was about, okay, how does he function? How does this guy operate? What is it like to have a conversation with someone like that? What happens when you talk to them? Yeah. I can't, I didn't come away with any information that I could use or explain to somebody else, but I came away with the, the certainty that he was quite of his, you know, he wasn't crazy at all. In other sense, he wasn't failing mentally. No. He was sharp as a he was sharper than I was for yeah. sure. And the feeling was also like here's a guy who's operating on 
without trying, he can he can handle any situation that I yeah. can throw at him, which you know isn't that much. But. So I again I went away for after two weeks. So you spent two weeks with him. Two weeks that time. Then I went back to New York and I worked, and then I booked a ticket to India where I knew he was going to be because I thought I want to see what he's like. And he was old by the time I met him. And already you can tell probably that I was fascinated by the guy. And I thought, I don't know how long he's going to be around, but I I really want to get more, I need to. I need more exposure to this yeah. guy. I need yeah. to find out more. So I booked a ticket to India. So. And, <laughs> you know, I had never, there were two places in the world that I was not interested in going in my life. Was, he, was he in India with his parents or so? Was so his parents were already dead? Or? With his parents? Yeah, he, 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 he was born in India. He was born in India. His parents, actually his mother died when he was an infant. Oh, that right. Yeah, and then his father left him. So his grandparents raised him. Yeah, yeah his grandparents and raised him. The grandfather was wealthy. Yeah. And a member of the Theosophical Society. Theosophical Society. Which was how the connection with Jiddu Krishnamurti occurred in his life. Yeah, because uh, the, he, the, he visited the house of his uh, grandfather. Yes, well actually he... And Madame Blavatsky was there too, I uh, remember. Well, Yuji met Jiddu Krishnamurti in the 40s, actually. Okay. He, he may have seen him on stage before that, but he officially met him in a small discussion group in Madras. When he, when Yuji was in his probably late twenties, early thirties, yeah, and that, at that point, they had a, uh, well, Yuji describes it in some places, but there was there was a one-on-one -on -one exchange. The, the, Yuji's daughters had told me that the, the one daughter I met said that they, they would go to his house and, and Jitta would play with her as a little girl, and they would go to concerts together, and so clearly Yuji had a real one-on-one -on -one discussion with this guy. Um, he had his own version of talking about that, but I was, I think that my obsession with Jiddu Krishnamurti gave me a kind of uh, a road inward to Yuji. My fascination with him or my, my, whatever, how I came to him was through that, I'm sure of it. Yeah, yeah. At the same time, my feeling is that with Yuji and JK, that Yuji, once, once this calamity hit, where, where the questioning business of seeking stopped, his uh, obsession with J.K. was, was over. What kind of calamity? I th my sense is that the calamity, as he described it, was the point where if thinking shuts down in the human organism for one split second, if that thing is, if that continuity is broken, that uh, causes a kind of reshuffling of the system. It's like a reboot, I, f I think. This mm -hmm. is all my speculation, based on listening to him. My sense is that it's, uh, it's like a restructuring, after which you don't function at the service of your ideas, but those ideas operate in your life as a kind of tool, like a pen that you pick up and put down, the thought is there available for you to use. Yeah. But you're not constantly writing to yourself. I'm looking at Willem de Ritter, I'm sitting at a table in Amsterdam, and this is a brown table, and it's made out of wood. And I'm not doing that all the time. Well, Yuji wasn't doing that all the time. But if you asked Yuji, what is, what is this? He would say, it's a table. What color is it? It's brown. But what he was trying to convey is that for him, while sitting idle, he didn't need to constantly tell himself, I'm sitting with Willem de Ritter, this yeah. is a table, it's hard, and, whereas I do that all the time. And he said, that's the only difference between us. Somehow the continuity, if it's ever broken, will put you in a situation where you no longer know all the time what's happening. Right. Because this knowing mechanism is actually the memory imposing the definitions of table, Willem, Lewis, Holland, conversation, enlightenment, all these are being imposed on this organism continuously. And if this thing that stops for one second and reboots, 
then that won't be happening all the time. You'll be sitting there and looking around like he would do. In an idle moment, he, you'd find him looking at things or, you know, just if the light changes over there, he'd look at that movement. We and had he, thoughts probably. No, and, and this is the thing that I think people walk right past that, him. Because what's sold to us is the image of the enlightened Swami who is like, Yeah, yeah, yeah. He moves slowly. He spouts wisdom in the most poetic way. And he's very kind. And deeply full of shit. And he wants your money. And he'll get it from you. And maybe he'll sleep with your wife, too, while he's at it. So Yuji was shouting at people and, you know, looking at, look at that thing over there, reading the signs. Like a little kid, yeah, just responding to what's going on naturally, yeah, without any pretense. Any utterance of pretense around that guy would would merit a nice solid blast. Shut up, bastard! You know you don't know what you're talking about. Don't be a German. What do you think? You know everything. You always have to be right. So he had that quality because, and he was very clear in his explanation of it, but what I have realized since meeting him, and since his death even, and my obsession goes on, because here's a guy who's not, he's not being tortured by this ideology thinking mechanism anymore. Yeah. How the hell did he do that? So I listen to him talk and I hear a guy who says, it, this is very simple, people. It's just that I'm not using thought all the time, that's all. Yeah. And then I hear the response to that, which is all of the baggage of whatever that individual has at their arsenal to defend their worldview. That enlightenment means you have to meditate for a certain period, then you have to have these experiences, then you have to behave that way. And why didn't you do this, UG? And why did you do that, UG? And how do I do this, UG? Yeah, yeah. And not listening to what he was saying. Yeah. Or even seeing what he was actually doing. I'm still interested in the calamity. Eh? When, how old was he when it happened? He was 48 years old. 49? 49. Multiples of 7. Yeah. 49. I'm horrible with numbers. And I believe this is my speculation because I, he used to tease me, and he said, you're an FBI agent. I'm an American, I guess I look like a cop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was fascinated. Okay, he meditated, he had all his spiritual experiences. And then he became obsessed with this notion, of what is enlightenment? If it's such a thing, what is that state of mind? What does that look like? The only example that he knew of that might be in that state was Jiddu Krishnamurti. Because as he said, I inherited three things from my grandfather. A lot of money, the Theosophical Society, and Jiddu Krishnamurti. Yeah. Yuji blew through all of his money. Then he lost his family. Then he, it, during that process, he dropped out of the Theosophical Society as a lecturer. But here's a guy who knew all the traditional, he, between the ages of 14 and 21, he did all the yogic meditation. Yeah, right. He had a guru in the traditional way. At the age of 21, he goes and meets Ramana Maharshi. He meets someone who seems authentic and whom he only spent one day with. But yeah. later he said, that man helped me to formulate this question, what is that state and how can one be in it? If that guy's enlightened, I'm just a, I'm a human being like him. I was born from a woman. How, what's the difference? So the question was there. And for whatever reason, Jiddu Krishnamurti was in his path. He believed that guy had it. So he kept on going and going and going to listen to that man speak while he asked himself this question, what am I doing here? Why am I listening to him? What is this feeling that I have of silence? And he seems to have gone through some very, uh, not very, but some, uh, some experiences which indicate a person who's on that track will go through these things. The headlessness is one. Uh, a kundalini experience seems to be some part of this, which has to do with the chakras. And there's a lot of material out there. Yeah, 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 yeah. He describes that this happened to him. He didn't really know what it was, and someone explained later that must have been this. And then he... And how long did it last? I have no idea. No idea. I think a few hours. Oh, a few hours. 
But he was not, not going to the hospital or... Uh, no, no, Yuji no. would never resort to those things. No, no, no. I mean, what's great is that he had a great background in the Indian traditions. Yeah. So he knew about these things. Yeah, right. I mean, that experience happened when he was down and out in London after his family was broken up. He was alone and penniless in London, and he went to the Ramakrishna mission for shelter. And they gave him a job helping edit the centennial edition of the Vivekananda newspaper. So he had a little job for the first time in a long time, and he was going into the meditation room and asking himself, why are these people all meditating? They're not going to get anything. This is all bullshit. Yeah. And then he started to feel this sensation in his body, which he later said that must have been a Kundalini because the, the energy was cycling through the penis and the top of the head and this yeah. kind of rotation. Yeah. Yeah. And he yeah. describes the whole thing. And then he said, well, you know, but the thing I like about Yuji is, okay, that happened. He didn't go out and start peddling that. He didn't say, I'm Yuji Krishnamurti, you want to... Uh, for ten dollars, I'll teach you how to have a Kundalini experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what most people do. Yeah. Instead, he did whatever he did there, and he went on. Yeah. It wasn't finished for him.